We are the Iron Disciples. In this podcast, we talk about bodybuilding, dating, finances, exploring these topics from a biblical standpoint, how to do these things as Christian men. Yeah. Okay. Today, we're going to be opening up Matthew chapter 4. This is the second chapter we're doing today, so we're all warmed up. Um, this is going to be great. Um, without further ado, guys, uh, who wants to lead in prayer? Joey Boy. Thank you, Lord, for today, the ability to do this. Thank you for our listeners. We pray that you will open our hearts together as we fellowship as three. And whoever else is listening, we welcome you into this fellowship together with us as we explore and dive deep mm -hmm. into this New Testament, chapter 4 of Matthew, and uncover many of those hidden gems we would like to share with you all. We thank you for this ability. Thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Super cool, guys. Jesus is about to turn it up a notch. Jesus said. He just got baptized. It's, oh, it's man. It's lit now. It's lit. <laughs> Prepare to lose your minds, people. That's what everybody was doing back then. They were just like, I can't believe it. I can't believe what I am seeing. I am blown away. Who is this guy? I'm sorry, that's my best Jewish action. It's probably horrible. <laughs> it sounded like Arabian. That's kind of what I thought. I was yeah, like, who knows? Is that Arabian? Some Jewish cousins got some Arabian cousins. Okay. So, so we're starting with Matthew chapter 4, and then we're going to go into the notes, right? Yes, sir. Awesome. Oh, well, I can start. The temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And he and the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down, fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and be behold, angels came, and we're ministering to him. I'm sure he probably ate after that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now when, he, now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to, into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Caperna, Cap, Capernaum Cap, yeah. by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Quote, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. For that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom in he of heaven is at hand. Jesus calls the first disciples. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee with their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus ministers to great crowds. And he went through Gal all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syrah, and they brought him back all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And the great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis, and went from Jerusalem and Judea and far beyond the Jordan. Jesus is a rock star. It's cranking. Yeah. Okay. 
Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. We are now entering the notes. I have the terms and people pulled up. Okay. Angel means messenger of God. There are three categories of heavenly jobs found in the Bible. Angels, cherubim, and seraphim along with corresponding hierarchy within those categories. Unfortunately, we confuse these job titles with the identity of heavenly beings. For example, if your dad was a plumber, you would understand that he is a man who works as a plumber. In the same way, we should see angel, cherub, seraphim as a heavenly job, as heavenly job titles conducted by heavenly beings. Satan means to accuse, to oppose, to act as an adversary. Satan is mistakenly referred to as a fallen angel, but it is truly a fallen cherub. Satan is extraordinarily powerful and leads a host of fallen angels against God. Satan has over 26 different names used in the Bible, all of them describing a character attribute relating to his opposition to God. Zebedee means gift from God. Zebedee was a fisherman and father of apostles James and John. James, son of Zebedee, James was a cognate to Jacob, ergo the name shares the same meaning, grabber and deceiver. James was a fisherman and brother to John, both called by Jesus the sons of thunder. James was the first to be martyred and the only apostle recorded as martyred in the New Testament. Disciple means student, learner, or follower. John means graced by God. John was a fisherman, son of Zebedee, and brother to James. He's responsible for writing the fourth gospel and three epistle letters, all entitled John, as well as the book of Revelation. Simon slash Peter. Simon means God has heard. Peter means rock or stone. Peter was a fisherman before being called by Jesus to lead the 12 apostles and the early church. Peter is a charismatic and fiery individual, outspoken and full of zeal. Andrew means manly, brave. Andrew was a fisherman and brother to Peter. Andrew is a first disciple and was baptized by John the Baptist. He was also a follower of John the Baptist. Disciple. Capernaum was a fishing village established during the time of the Hazomenians, located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Zebulun means dwelling of honor. Zebulun is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Naphtali means my struggle. Naphtali is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Syria means breastplate. During biblical times, Syria was a historic region including several Armenian kingdoms covering much of the present-day Syria, southeastern Turkey, and parts of Lebanon and Iraq. Pretty big spot. Decapolis was a group of 10 cities on the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire in the southeastern Levant in the first century BC and AD. Temptation is the act of considering or causing to consider doing something wrong or unwise. Fasting is the abstinence, either complete or partial, lengthy or short duration of intermittent or anything consumable. Fasting in biblical terms is a tool used to put the flesh into submission and get closer connection with God. What is the purpose of Jesus getting tempted by Satan? Jesus is known as the second Adam. Adam was the first man made by God and the first man to sin against God. Adam's sin changed his fleshly body, making it a vessel that would die. This original sin was passed on to his children and their children after that, with each generation concluding in death. In this fallen state, man needed a Messiah, a redeemer to give mankind a fresh start and overcome death. In order for Jesus to redeem the world, it makes sense that Jesus must succeed where Adam had failed. This is why Jesus is called the second Adam. Jesus is faced with a very similar, albeit much more difficult, set of temptations. Let's look at the three categories of temptation indicated in 1 John 2.16. Quote, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, it is not from the Father, but it is from the world. So A, we can be tempted by the lust of our physical body, that is our flesh. B, We can be tempted by the lust of our eyes, which refers to the desires that captivate us and distract us from following God. And C, and we can finally be tempted to boast the vain vain glory of life, which is anything that appeals to our pride or sense of self-worth apart from God. Now let's look at Eve's temptation with the forbidden fruit. 
in Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was de a delight to the eyes and that the tree w was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. All three categories of sin are there. A, the tree was uh, good for food equals the temptation of the f our flesh. B, the tree was a delight to the eyes equals the lust of the eyes. And C, the tree was desired to make one wise equals the boastful pride of life. Jesus was tempted by Satan in all three categories as well. A, he was tempted to give into his, bo his body's demand for food, which equals the temptation of the flesh. B, he was tempted by a vision of what he could gain without the need to experience the suffering of the cross equals the lust of the eyes. And C, tempted by his pride to defend his honor and reputation as the son of God equals boastful pride of life. Why was Jesus in a fasted state when he underwent temptation? Fasting is the act of putting the flesh into submission by practicing abstinence from consumables. Most often food is what we abstain from when fasting, but a fast can span the gamut from taking a break from social media to cutting out caffeine. The point to focus on when considering a fast is to abstain from something that you really, really like or feel you depend on. This in turn directs that energy and desire into a faith-based devotion. A fast, in effect, you're declaring through action that this perceived need, what you're fasting from, no matter how important or vital, is second to your relationship with God. Fasting, according to the Bible, strengthens the spirit. Many times the figures in the Bible will fast after a sinful behavior to show repentance. Jonah 3.5, after doing something risky to ask for favor. Esther 4.16, Ezra 8.21-23, through 23. mourning after a death, 2 Samuel 1.12, to petition the Lord on behalf of a personal need or desire, 2 Samuel 12.16, or simply to practice worship. Joel 2.15, the overarching purpose across all our motivations to fast is that our words and desires are more profoundly expressed to God. In Daniel chapter 10, we see how powerful fasting and prayer can be. Daniel 10.2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Daniel 10:10 10, 10 through 12. And behold, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for, for, for from the first day that, your, that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. A heavenly being, Daniel does not indicate who, tells Daniel that because of his fasting and prayer, his words had been heard in turn casting action into the heavenly realm to take place on his behalf. Incredible. So now, even considering that Jesus, after 40-day fast, was most likely quite emaciated, we now know that although his body was weak, his spirit was strong. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. We know that God's desire was for Jesus to be properly prepared for his tempting, and that meant fasting and prayer. Those are our tools, guys. We don't have bazookas. We don't have landmines or atomic bombs. We got fasting. Who is Satan? Why is he different from other heavenly entities? Satan first appears in the third chapter of the Bible when he confronts woman in the garden and ultimately tempts her and man into sin. As we see, Satan's already full of hatred for God and speaking pure lies. So we wonder... How did Satan become this horrible adversary of God? Satan's backstory is important to understanding what's happening in Matthew 4. So let's take a moment in the book of Ezekiel 12, 19. 
You are the signet, signet, signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Very pre- Every precious stone was your covering sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings on the day that you were created. They were prepared for they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because you of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before the kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you, and I turned you to ash on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. Ezekiel says Satan was created full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. The word full in Hebrew carries the sense of completeness or an abundance, and perfect can mean entirely consumed. So Satan was complete in wisdom and completely consumed in beauty. It's important to note that this implies Note that implicit in this, we see that something made perfect is capable of losing that gift of perfection. It speaks to the sovereignty of choice God allowed his creation. And furthermore, it shows us that although Jesus was perfect, he had to maintain that perfection through every choice and action. Back to Satan. We now understand that no thing created, no created thing possessed greater wisdom or more beautiful than Satan. Imagine the wisest person who ever lived. Then consider the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in creation. Satan exceeded both. Furthermore, the Lord testifies in verse 15 that Satan was blameless in his ways from the day of his creation. Satan was without sin, perfectly obedient to the Father from the beginning of his existence. Notice the job God assigns Satan as his service in heaven. The text says Satan was the covering cherub. Cherubim are the highest order of heavenly beings, and Satan was the wisest and most beautiful of these angelic creatures. Scripture says Satan held the most coveted position in creation, serving God as the covering cherub. That phrase may ring a bell for you because it comes from the instructions given to Moses on how to build the tabernacle. Specifically, cherubim were part of the design of the Ark of the Covenant, which we hear about in Exodus. In conclusion, We say these things not to extol or adulate Satan, but to clearly understand our adversary. To understand your adversary means you will not be surprised at their capabilities or strategies. It is our due diligence as men and women of God to be thorough and leave no stone unturned. Yes, the battle is won and God is triumphant, but we we each must battle and endure, as Paul so often says, through the power of our Lord to glorify God's magnificent purpose. Satan has a purpose, as do all things God creates. We must humble ourselves to understand the mystery of God's intention and be faithful, though our sovereign, be faithful through our sovereignty of choice. We must endure. What did Jesus' ministry look like? Jesus only had three years to accomplish all that the Father had, has planned for his earthly ministry. In that short time, Jesus needed to move quickly from beginning in one moment in... <coughs> From beginning or from being in one moment a nobody from a backwater town in Nazareth to the next moment being a rock star with a very large following. His healing ministry served that purpose, Matthew says, that large cl- crowds followed Jesus. These people came from around the Galilee, which generally describes the area west of the Sea of Galilee. The Galilee covers about 2,800 square miles, and in Jesus' day it was home to about 3 million people, a sizable territory to cover. They also came from Decapolis, which is area east of the Jordan, from Damascus, Judea, and Jerusalem. We're talking about people coming from hundreds of miles by f- away by foot through the desert and during an age when there was no instant communication. 
Imagine how powerful Jesus' draw must have been in that day to bring people from so far merely by word of mouth. This man Jesus was up to something very big. There's no proper or academic way to put this. People were going crazy, and for good reason, and let's look at why. We can assume that Jesus was healing virtually everyone who came to him. The word was out that if you wanted, wanted restored health, it was happening in Galilee. Matthew says Jesus was traveling throughout the Galilee, teaching in synagogues with his first few key disciples. Matthew gives us a brief, brief list of the ailments Jesus healed. First, he healed various diseases, diseases, which refers to general physical ailments. Secondly, he healed pains, which literally translates as torments or torture. Anyone who has suffered under chronic pain understands why the Greek language refers to such pains as torture. Thirdly, Matthew mentions the healing of demon, demons, demon addicts. <laughs> demon. <laughs> Demon. <laughs> That's a weird look. Demoniacs. Da demoniacs. Yeah. A demoniac <laughs> was someone indwelled by a demon. In Jesus' day, people understood that some maladies were not the result of natural causes, but rather of de uh, demonic activity. In other words, demoniacs manifested either physical or mental illness, resulting from the damage inflicted on their mind and body by demons. So as Jesus removed the demons, the people were made instantly well. Finally, Jesus healed epileptics and paralytics. These are essentially opposite conditions. Epileptic was the ancient term for someone who had seizures, which are uncontrolled bodied movements. While paralytics were those who lost use of limbs, Jesus healed both conditions. In Jesus' day, there was no medical cures for these conditions. Even today, we still don't have solutions to many of these diseases. And even in cases where we do have treatments, many of our treatments do little more than mask the symptoms. This is especially true for demoniacs since modern society doesn't recognize this condition as real. Jesus' healing was a full and complete restoration of the body in all cases. His was a healing that distinguished Jesus as someone greater than a mere medicine man. Even today in the age of science and modern medicine, miracle healings like these would be mind-blowing. Therefore, as Jesus performed these miracles, he was making an undeniable statement of his divinity. Jesus was demonstrating that he possesses the power to address the human condition with merely a word or touch. Jesus can bring the human body back to an ideal state, to full health. That ability to restore the human body to its ideal state is the unique calling card of the creator himself. Only the one who has created the human body possesses the power to restore us in perfection. This power isn't limited to our physical condition. Anyone who witnessed Jesus' healing in this way would have instinct instinctively appreciated Jesus' power over the human body, and from that conclusion, it's just a small step to conclude that Jesus must also possess the power to heal the soul. In conclusion, Matthew focuses on five areas of impact. First, Matthew relates Jesus' authority as a teacher and preacher of God's word. Secondly, Matthew describes Jesus' power to heal the human condition. Thirdly, Matthew shows Jesus' authority to defeat the enemy and his demons. Fourthly, Matthew shows Jesus held the authority over the Sabbath and therefore all Jewish law and tradition. And finally, Matthew relates examples of Jesus' power over creation itself by describing Jesus' power in these areas. Matthew supports these, or his claim, or his main claim that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the King and the ruler of Israel and of the world. Matthew begins this narrative focused on the most important of these areas of authority, Jesus' authority in teaching the Word of God, because as impressive as Jesus' miracles are, they always served a greater purpose, which was to bring attention to Jesus' words. Mm -hmm. That's why the next chapters of this gospel focus on the Sermon on the Mount. Very cool. And that's it. I always, you know, as a kid, we we're always attracted to miracles, as was most of those people. And so there's a lot of good teachers, people that are going to be great with the words, are going to get people. Um, they know the Pharisees were present and they were in every one of these towns and they're in the synagogues and the synagogues had all this order for teaching. They had order for worship. Um, they didn't have to look far if you were in a Jewish community for teaching. You really didn't, um, which was great. In many ways, the Pharisees and I got a heart for the Pharisees because there were no synagogues before the Pharisees. Obviously, we, we covered that in the, the past chapter. There is one temple. Right. And that's where you, you conducted God's business was in that temple. And so the Pharisees were like, well, we need we need better uh, people are living out there. Maybe they're poor. Maybe they can't come here. Like, let's let's spread this out a little bit. So so God is there more often. So in a way, I love the Pharisees for that. You know, they are trying to make God more approachable 
for all these other people that were there, the other Jews, the poor people, the people, you know, outreach, basically, you could think of it that way. So they had teaching, you know, but nothing's, these are people, you know, when David Blaine did his thing in, in, uh, what did he do it? He did it in the middle of, of New York city. So everybody could go look at him when he was doing his fast. He did a long fast. I think it was a 40 day fast. Um, people want to see spectacle. Um, and so the many ways those miracles were there, not only did it say, oh man, this guy is really powerful, but he's waiting in the next chapter is there to show that these, now people are hanging on his word. Now they see like, what is this guy going to say? What does he believe? And he's healing everybody. He's a nice guy. He's, he's taking his time. You know, if he could be, who knows what these powers have enabled him to do. Maybe he's a rule, you know, they're thinking a bunch of that, but he, you know, he spent time with the poor, sick people. He must be a good guy. Let's hear about what he has to say. And that for me, when I, when I understand that, you know, a lot of times going back to service for us, that is a typology that we're supposed to sort of follow. We may not be have miracles. We not, I mean, we can lay hands on each other and, and miracles do happen. Please do not let me, they will happen. And if you're a believer, get ready for them. But that servitude, that's what Jesus was doing. He was serving the sick and the needy. He was doing that. And so he got a part of their heart when he did that, which is what we talk about in group. When he went, when we have friends, people in our lives, and God makes known these, these situations where you can either be for them or you can do something, you know, selfish. Well, I'm going to watch my Netflix movie, but, you know, somebody's got this issue. I'm going to just go do this for a while. Um, you missed out on that opportunity. You did. You could have done that. Maybe that person, you know, there's work to be done in service. Jesus lived that for us. And so we don't have miracles. I mean, we do. Maybe you do. Maybe you got a gift of healing, and uh, that's amazing. Uh, but, our, you know, sometimes they're humble, right? Sometimes it's listening to somebody, picking up a phone call when you'd rather go to sleep. Little things. And isn't it interesting today what draws crowds now? <laughs> The type of people that draw crowds, yeah. whether it's our politicians or celebrities, they're just a lot of them are just garbage human beings. And yeah, a lot of them telling people what they they and that's another thing. So like if somebody are the gospel, right, we're, we're called to preach it. We're called to share it. Um, there will be that juncture where you they're like, I like this Jesus guy. He sounds great. But sin. But leaving your, okay, then they're going to get pushed back. You have to almost guarantee, I mean, you might have a conversion where you see somebody's just like, yeah, this life is horrible. Those are sins. Absolutely. I'm changing it all right now. I'm ready to change. Like I've already went through the ringer, you know, but most of the time people are going to dig in their heels and be like, what? I can't do this anymore. I can't listen to this kind of music. Right. So you're going to get that. And so with these people that we see nowadays, like the entertainment we have, Paul talks about these guys, and we see them as the prosperity gospel teachers. They're tickling people's ears. You know, it's like, I'm going to tell you what you really want to hear, and you're going to keep listening to me because I'm not really convicting you. Or, there's no call to honor, no call to change. Basically, you're great the way you are. You know, as a matter of fact, you're doing too much. You're a high achiever. You know, you got bonus points stacked up. Our message is a little different. You know, you're not going to achieve anything. There's nothing by works. All your good deeds are just God working through you. You can't take any claim or glory. It's just not for you. A true worshiper knows that's our form of worship. He glorif we, we get to give glory to God. Oh, that's awesome. What do we do with our spiritual gifts? We cast them to God. We give them better to give than to receive. So yeah, it's no, no surprise when you have the entertainers of the day will be the same way that the entertainers of back in those days. They're tickling people's ears. You know, it, it's one thing to feel good and encouraged by a sermon, and that's fine. Um, words of encouragement are needed. You need to go up to your brothers and say, God has anointed you to do this. You have a gift. There is beautiful. You have extolled me by just your presence. You've done, you know, and that's like adulate, that's extolling. You know, that's an actual gift of encouragement. That exists. Some people are really good at it. Um, but if that's all that's happening, you have to ask yourself, this is not a balanced uh, narrative here. It's not a balanced, this is not balanced. Um, we hear this a lot in, 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 in culture these days. How does it go? It's like you're perfect the way you are, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Except the, yeah, you got to be yourself. Be yourself, <laughs> live your truth. And it's like everyone has room for improvement. Stop selling that lie. Right. And that's the refresher that we get because how stifling would it be to not be able to improve? 
that sounds like hell to me. You know, you're the best you're going to be. No. And so Jesus had to, he knew that his message, even his disciples said later in the gospels, when he was talking about, this is my flesh, this is my blood. Was it Peter? He's like, that's a hard one. He's like, that's going to be tough, Jesus. People are going to have to get over the fact that they're eating your blood and your body. (laughs) This is not an easy one to understand. And so he had to explain it in the form of sacrifice. You are. This is you. It's not that you're consuming it with your mouth, although like baptism, it's a sign. It's it's a sort of what's the word for something we do? It's not routine, but um, ritual. A ritual. Yeah. Um, with 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 supernatural implications that says Jesus's body, his perfect body, the blood is actually covering us. So we we do that. These are hard teachings. So no yeah. one's just going to listen to Jesus right off the bat unless he's like healing the sick. And they're like, you know what? Even though that's a really rough teaching because, you know, Mike picked up my phone call and he helped me with my flat tire at 10. You know, I know you had to go to the gym, but, you know, he skipped on it to come help me. I'm going to listen to what he has to say. This is just general idea of reciprocity we have built into us. So, you know, side note on the communion thing. Go listen to like from two weeks ago, Bayside's sermon. Um it was a week before Easter. Yeah. So the backstory to like the Jewish tradition of the Passover. And if once you understand that and how that meal works. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? I, I can't do it justice. You'd have to watch the sermon. Well, Passover, we, we know what that's from, right? That's when, yeah. when the, the angel. Right. But was... they have like a very complicated meal tradition. Oh. The Jewish faith, the, the people that follow Judaism. So they, they in that sermon took, he had like the whole plate the meal set up and went through all the steps with it. And then when you see that play out and you see what, then that's what Jesus was doing that night at the last supper. And you see that play out and you realize what he's doing at the end. It's like, this all makes sense. My gosh. There's so much more to that. He's the final context. Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. Isn't it? That makes sense. The final sacrifice. Well, because the Passover angel, he's killing all for those who don't know. Is it Pat? And correct me if I'm wrong. I got you guys here. Um, In Egypt. One of the plagues was to kill the firstborn, the Egyptians. So they took some blood of a lamb, put it over the, the door, and that angel would pass over. Yes. And so it's being thankful that Lord spared those sons out of your faith of putting the blood on the door seal or on the door, whatever, the top of the door, right? Mm-hmm. So, ah, man, I can't wait till we get to that chapter because that's just opening up my mind. I mean, seeing Jesus doing that as the last Passover, you know, those who accept Christ's blood, the blood of the lamb that's over the top of the door. Think about it, guys. This is why this, it's just foreshadowing the perfection of the ultimate sacrifice. And so back to, to messages. If you're being convicted by a message, somebody tells you something about the Bible, you got sin in your life, something like that. Um, Lean into it. Lean into it. When God can strip you down, take some of those carnal things out of your life, you're, you stand to gain so much more. The people who stuck around Jesus after he healed them and listened into the hard spots where they didn't understand, those people, that reciprocity, that care, they didn't just walk away. Oh, I got my piece. I'm done. Grandma's healed. Let's go home, guys. You know, none of that. They wanted to stay and say, what about the spirit? This guy's talking about the spirit. He healed the body. What's coming next? The Beatitudes is coming next. The Sermon on the Mount is coming next. So um, it's really powerful to understand the typology there. We serve we serve so we can gain that reciprocity, that ear from the people. It is. And um, I was thinking, as Iron Disciples, we bodybuild. And that healing of these ailments Christ is going through healing the body and these people see that if he can heal the body possibly he might be able to heal the spirit too because let's be real people know when they have problems that they can't get over Um, whether they have a gambler let's take for existence Mm. he knows he's got a problem oh yeah or if you got a problem with addiction like or pornography you know you have a problem chances are you, you want to get over it on some subconscious level. There's a yearning inside of you that says, this sucks. Your conscience. I would rather not do this anymore and be free of this because I feel like a slave. I am not in control. 
that is not a place where I want to be for the rest. I want to I want to transcend this state. Mm-hmm. People have those ailments. Jesus is healing the body. He's also going to heal, heal the spirit as well. And I think we see as Jesus was being tempted by Satan, his body was emaciated, like com- very, I mean, I couldn't imagine fasting for 40 days. Well, I think David Blaine talked about it. He was forever damaged from it, I think. Even I, on wow. Rogan, I'm pretty sure he said that. Really? Yeah, like he still hasn't fully recovered from it. Yeah, that kind of fasting is is intense. And I know that, so you have to, we talked about how powerful Satan is. We talked about how he has, basically he's second powerful under God. And I'm not talking about Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Those are one person. I'm saying under those, you have Satan. He's wise like you wouldn't believe. He knows you and what works on you like you wouldn't believe. He, he knows you inside and out. He's dealt with all kinds of versions of you. So you're not outsmarting Satan unless you have the you have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, the power. So how, how did he get set up? And this is such a good question. This is such a good topic for us because fasting is one of our super tools. Think about it. Jesus fasted when he met and faced off with Satan. That's a big deal. Everybody should be freaking out about that. Be like, oh, stuff's going wrong in my life. What do I do? Oh, maybe read the Bible. No, fast. That's what Jesus did when things were extremely rough. He stayed up all night praying too. Of course, there's other tools, but that's how powerful fasting is. That's what made him able to withstand the temptation of Satan. I like to point out that he not only fasted from food, but he was in a desolate place, the desert, where there was no interaction with people. There was no place for shade. So he wasn't only fasting from food. He was fasting from society. Society and also didn't go to a place where there was trees, where he <laughs> could get away from the sun blasting him every day or some of these other things. He was putting the his flesh into the most submission he possibly could because he knew the devil was going to use his flesh against him. God knew that he, the de- that's how powerful the flesh that we contend with is. So we have demons, we have spiritual warfare, we have all these things. But this flesh vessel that has original sin inside of it is one of the most powerful things to contend with it in is. and of itself. And Don't that's even why bring spiritual warfare into the fa- into the matter. There are two domains that we fight against. We have a carnal domain, meaning you have carnality that's part of your being at this moment in time. We contend with that. That is one domain. Then you have the spiritual domain, right? You're not always getting attacked by a demon when you're tempted to do something bad. That might be your carnal battle, okay? So you, you need to understand they overlap. The demons, the spiritual battles, they're going to work and use your carnality as leverage. Fine. But you could be having a perfect walk. Well, no one's going to have a perfect walk. But you could have a great walk. And your carnality, can, I mean, this is something we deal with with Iron Disciples, okay? we got a lot of guys. They're great-looking guys. They go to the gym. They're trying to be healthy. But that can easily go and turn into vanity. You can easily start giving this more priority than the Word of God. You can start thinking about it, the desire, how it stacks up. It's just the time logs of what you're doing in your head. If it's taking precedence over the Bible, you got a problem. So carnal battles, they're important to understand. A woman's going to have each, 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 each individual has a different kind of carnal battle. You better know because like for some people, they might be really greedy. Maybe that's what, what creeps up on them. They're always trying to make money. Where can I get money? Where can I get money? They're seeing people as stepping stones. They, that might be a carnal issue. Maybe that's a, but this is where it requires prayer. That's what requires fasting. How do you look at these two spiritual battlefronts and be able to understand them? Right. So going further, the carnal battle, Christ puts his flesh into submission as far as he can. God himself facing off, knowing the devil's coming to him. He sets up himself for success. He says, I'm going to put my flesh into absolute submission so that the devil cannot use it against me. Right. That's What's right. the next thing he does once the devil comes and approaches him? What does he use as his main tool to communicate the, with the devil? The only tool. The only tool. That he uses besides, yes, he uses the word word of God. There you go. He could speak to him and say he is God. He could speak to him and say, listen, you dirty dog. (laughs) Why don't you get the heck out of here? here? 
You know what I mean? He didn't say that. Drop some. I think I've reflected bombs. on this. He did not I've say that. I've reflected. So, so Jesus does a lot of things that um you we just think about God, right? Is it necessary that He has to go through this process? A lot of what He does is for us. So him asking those questions is showing us that these are the different kinds of sin that exist in the world. These are the temptations, sort of the battlefronts we're going to face. He could have said, Satan, be gone. Been done with it. What good would have that done for us? Jesus is a servant. He's serving us by going through those specific questions. Teaching us. Teaching. Showing serving. us. That's service to us. Explaining. Yeah, there's it. purpose in it. What, you think Jesus is just like, okay, you done, Satan? Are we done here? No, Jesus knows. There's the questions that need to be asked. And when it was done, it was done. Satan be gone, gone. He was not doing any of these things by, say he's God, and God doesn't need to do anything beyond what he's already chosen to do, and he chose to serve by teaching us. And so, yes, we're going to face all of those sins, those three sins it talks about in James. You will face all of those sins. May it be from a carnal battle or a spiritual battle or both. doesn't matter. That does matter. You need to pray about that because sometimes you might have a demonic oppression in your life that's very real and you need to get on your knees and fast and maybe get some people in your church praying with you. I mean, that stuff exists. You got to deal with it. The spiritual battle is a real deal thing. But he asked, he asked the questions. He responds in the word of God. He memorized these things. He was speaking by the power of God. When you read the beginning of the gospel of John, what does it say? The word was with God. The word became flesh. He was the word. That's what he used to fight the offense with of Satan, in addition to fasting. I'm sure when he was out there fasting for 40 days, he was praying too. All right, he probably wasn't just walking around, just looking at the sun, wishing his 40 days was up. He was in there praying, having, I mean, that's what I like to believe he was doing, praying, having communion with God, preparing. So these are our tools as Christians. We don't get a bazooka. We don't get a sign up. We get an M16. These things aren't, on the surface, very attractive, but they're extremely powerful. And we need to put ourselves in the place where we're exploring them. And God is able to teach us how to use them to face temptation, to grow. I mean, when you face some temptation and you grow from it, what happens? You grow. You get to help others grow. The body becomes stronger. All of a sudden, you're closer to the end. The bride of Christ is coming together. She's got her gown on. She's, got, she's ready to go. This is how we advance the kingdom. We're, that's our job is to advance the kingdom. Yes, know what you're fighting and why you're fighting it and be diligent with your tools so that you can properly battle. Use them. Use, Use them. them. Know what you confront them. and be ready for it. It's going to happen. Um, going back to what Mike had brought up within the celebrities and how, how, how we garner attention in the world today. Oh, it's because horrible. Because Christ was going out and doing people solids and getting attention through healing the body. And then hopefully having their attention to heal their souls because that's your eternal being. That's what really matters. You can heal your body, but that's only going to last a small amount of time. It's nothing. It's not going to last I mean, eternity. it's something, but it's not your spirit. If you can build a strong spirit and you can save your spirit, we're together for eternity. That's the real goal here. That's the real, that's what we want as Christians. That's why we love people. That's why we're willing to do these things for bodies and for people, help them with finances, help them with their, with their, with their broken down cars, whatever it takes to get their attention, just like the missionaries did in, in the Arabian states that they did that. They serve people. This is how we get their attention. But we come in contact with this world to where we have to sell the gospel. We have to sell Jesus. We feel like we do. And how do we do this? And we're confronted with what John said, like prosperity gops, gospels, right. where things are going to be peachy keen, and like it, we're, if you're if you're if as you're a believer, path, as a believer, it's going to be easy. You need it to should. get easier. These types yeah. of things do not apply. Okay, it's, we don't sell the gospel. The gospel is yeah. is something the Holy Spirit works in the heart of yeah. someone, and that we're well, we're those midwives, we're ready to help take it out That's of right. God's doing we're the work. Tool. Yeah. We're a tool. Yeah. We're we're conduit. We're, yeah. we're sitting there waiting for these opportunities to happen. That's when right. they happen, we're sensitive to them, and then we, we're there for them because we're sensitive, because we're listening, and we're loving these people. We're sensitive to them. We're not saying, oh, look at all this stuff, and come on by. I'm going to sell you this stuff. You want this. You want to be successful. You want all this glory and so, life So going back to the carnal battle, your, your carnal self likes to be indulged. It likes, you know, steak dinners. It likes to have the shrimp cocktail. It wants a nice whiskey on the rocks. You know, we like nice bourbons. You know, spend the extra hundred bucks. Give me the nice one. You know, we like good things. There's nothing wrong with liking good things. But you get conditioned 
and this is the beauty this is the beauty and the horror of life you can get, you can condition yourself to like good things it gets easier to desire the word as you pour into the word at first it might not make sense it's a tough document you know but trying to, i'm going i have a story for for this bible's great but um you need to be your conscience needs to be dialed in so that when you're noticing you're listening to people who are tickling your ears more and you're just feeling good about being you you're not growing that should be the most terrifying thing of your life if you're not growing and god made you an infinite cr- creature what are you doing you're dying you I'd like to dying. take that to bodybuilding so, real quick, just as a footnote, really quick, okay. is because and in any and in re, really any art form. And I had this thought the other day because I was thinking about critic and criticism, mm. and how critic. And I looked it up. The definition has two definitions: one, when you're talking to a person, and generally you're taking apart their negative attributes. It's a negative connotation to it. When you're doing it with a literary work. It's positive and negative. You're at you're weighing out the goods and the bads. You're taking an analytical approach to it, saying, how could this be better and how is it good? Now, as bodybuilders, we look at our body and we're constantly trying to find out how can we make this lacking body part better. So we're criticizing our bodies and holding it under the holding ourselves to our weakest points. We don't focus on these giant biceps because they're great. We're looking at these weak triceps with these crappy hamstrings and saying, how can I grow those? Same with guitar, you know, or music. I'm not looking at, oh, I'm so great at this one thing. I'm like, I suck at this. I'm going to try and get better at this. I can't hold a tune or my pitch is off. You know, I mean, really work on my right hand technique. I'm holding too much tension in it. We're working on all those points so we can become better. And, and that really, is those really are the f- at the core. What I hear you saying is you have to be honest. If you're fixated on the things that you're great at, you're not being honest with all the other places you can grow. You feel good about yeah. it, but you're not actually You're looking at your better. big biceps all the time. And you, you got, got little small tiny little legs. Legs. <laughs> little skinny yeah. ones. Yeah, you're scared to look at those legs. <laughs> you, you'd rather live in denial of those legs. Just cut the mirror off at yeah. the waist. Yeah, cut it off. <laughs> no one wants to see that. We're wearing pants for the rest of our yeah. life. <laughs> so that's that's the dishonesty within what you're desiring. So it's honesty. When you have somebody who's honest, by virtue of their honesty, they're going to be the best writer. They're going to be the best guitar player. They're going to be the best. Why? Because they see those those lacking areas and they work on them. The church needs to fast more. The church needs to pray more. But let me go back to the story. I did want to say this story, okay? Mm -hmm. This is something to encourage uh, anybody who opens up this book and kind of feels like, all right, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so a teacher that I love a lot, he's an Englishman. His name is uh, Derek Prince. He's a scholar. He went to Cambridge University, old time. I think he went there. He got drafted into the war, so I don't know. It was like that old, the 1940s. And... uh, he got one book to take with him. He had already read Socrates, Aristotle, Confucius, um, many of these philosophers he'd read. And so in his little sack, they allow you to take like a little sack and you can fill it with whatever you want, but nothing more than that can fit in that sack. And so he's like, I'll take the Bible. So one thing I haven't read, I've read everything else, but I'm going to take that stinking Bible. They're everywhere. So he got a Bible and he brought it with him. And he's, he's telling, I'm watching this, you know, YouTube video, I'm listening to him. And he's like, you know, the first book I opened up that did not make perfect rational sense to me. And I sat there with the Bible and I was like, this is the most popular book in the world. It out sells everything else. It's, it's everywhere. And yet on the surface, when you just crack it open, it doesn't make sense. But he was a scholar, so he stuck with it. He kept on reading it baffling him moving through every awkward contortion of the old he started with the old testament too so he's like man this is really just getting you know i'm getting about six months later he starts to understand he starts to rationalize on what he's reading you know but he gave it time this is the same thing why is jesus in the woods or the desert for 40 days why not one day time you need time you need time to accomplish stuff He gave it that time, and he started to realize that the deep wisdom in the Bible is not something that you just get like that. There's elements in the New Testament and the Old Testament that do come easily, but it's a living document. It's a living word. It's a supernatural document. I think it was six months later, the Holy Spirit nailed him. He was sitting on a, a little stool, 
Nailed him right off the stool. He's in tears. Couldn't believe it. He hadn't even gotten the New Testament, I don't think. But that by virtue of just putting time into this, this living word worked on him. It softened him. It worked. He didn't even understand what he was understanding, but that's the power of God. These are the miracles we're talking about. You got to believe in them. When I, when I read the Bible, I read the New Testament. It made a lot more sense to me than the Old Testament did at first. But if we have a high view of Scripture, we got to understand there's going to be parts in this book we don't fully outright understand. Everybody knew that as, as, as a Jew. The prophecies, some of these things are cryptic. They're cryptic for a reason. We have to have a high view of Scripture, which that calls for faith. If we could rationalize on everything like Confucius, Aristotle, Socrates, what we would know is that is a book of men. Men wrote that book because I get it all and I'm a man, so I can speak man. This book is a book written by God through men. So there's going to be stuff that you just do not get. And you have to walk by faith and pray for revelation as God manifests his infinite beauty to you through this word. There's going to be hard things to swallow in this word. This word is not all easy. No walk is easy. Fasting for 40 days in the desert, that's about as hard as it gets. I don't think anybody could really do that without feeling, uh, you know, he was hungry, right? That's all they say. <laughs> Jesus was hungry. I could imagine a lot more on that. He's probably extremely tired. He's probably hanging on to life by a thread. He, lifting his eyelids was probably like, ugh, tough to do. That's where he was at. I'd like to further go on, and this is something a bit of... Um, so the revelation comes, the Holy Spirit comes, and then we're having new words spoken. We, Paul writes, John writes, James writes. We have these new words that are coming. Christ in the Holy Spirit living inside of each one of us um, literally speaks every day. Yes, he does. This revelation is constant. We worship a living God that is that is working today. And I just want us, because this book is, this is a very, this is a special document, living document. And it was there, a lot of the Torah was there because God only spoke to Moses and a few people every once in a while. Um, that's the way God does that's things. That's the way he does things. And then the new covenant came, and then we had Paul, and he's writing. It's part of this book. John started writing. Part of this book. Luke, John, I mean, these. it got um, it got added to. We had amendments happen. Things started, because God was living on earth now. It wasn't just Satan. It wasn't just man. Now we have Christ inside of human beings speaking. So I want to, I want to alert our attention to the audience, guys, Re treat people with that respect and that love that Christ is in there and he's speaking and and that's he's working today and this word is living today yeah, and, and even if you don't understand today. what you're reading there's a work being done in you I think Joe hit a really good point so like there's a lot of auxiliary works out there I love C.S. Lewis I'm a C.S. Lewis I love his work I feel like you know but the only way you're going to be informed enough to discern an auxiliary work from heresy tickling exactly. the ears is by knowing this book first. 100%. So if you are loving and being wrapped up in like one teacher and you're reading his books and you know, you're doing that 75%. Or a preacher. Or a pre that's why I said a teacher, preacher. Okay. Same cool. thing. Um, uh, what else would there be? Uh, just a writer maybe. It doesn't matter if he's a preacher. Just some guy who's an influencer. And you're doing that more than you're reading the Bible. You're not going to have the discernment to distinguish heresy from encouragement. You know, so you need to start there first. And if you don't get it, like Derek Prince, he's reading this thing just going, now oh, this makes sense. Gets slammed <laughs> off of his stool. Yeah. Boom. When you're reading those type like preachers or whatever, you're letting them do the work for you. True. And you need to put in the work yourself and then add those as auxiliaries because then you will have the discernment to tell. Exactly. You know, who is full of crap or not. And that was your point. You know, early on in the Bible study, Mike would call me. He's like, you know, we got to get the guys to read. What are we going to do to get them to work? And we thought about it. I was like, what do we do? And we talked about this. And no one really wants to work when the work is getting done for them, you mm -hmm. know? And it was such a good point because now it's like, well, what are you bringing to the table, guys? God's going to work through you uniquely to sharpen me. He's going to give you a word. It's a living document, so he's going to work through you specifically. And you're cutting me out of that because you're not reading your Bible. You're screwing me and yourself, too. That's what it, what it is. Well, and it's also like you're – like part of the reason I would bring that up is you would put such great effort into 
notes and kind of an interpretation, but they got to read, they got to do the exactly. work themselves so they know if you. I'm, that's they what gotta Paul dis- told. Yeah, they yeah. got to discern against what you're producing. Paul told the church, and said, to, you like, guys like me, great, but are you cross-examining what I'm telling you? Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're just setting yourself up for ultimate deception exactly. in the Ford because you're either putting faith in this document and Christ and the Holy Spirit inside of you so that whenever you read this, you're having revelation. It's a living document. Guaranteed. God speaking to you. That's right. And this is the way we f- we start that relationship, that foundation of the newborn after baptism. This is the way it begins. Okay? So once you have this understanding... I want okay, oh guys. I'm reading the Constitution, trying to write bones for Iron Disciples for this country. Now they wrote the Constitution, and then they had amendments afterwards. Now these amendments are part of the Constitution, okay? Mm. Because this country changed a lot really quickly, and they had to address problems that Slavery, the that right? the first founding mm-hmm. fathers did not foresee. Mm-hmm. Slavery is a great one. Oh. Yeah, that, that was a good amendment. Great amendment. It's a great example. So I want to direct attention and real value to auxiliary works because we live in a world where Christ is like C.S. Lewis. The Great Divorce. That book describes heaven and hell better than I think any other thing I've ever document I've ever read. The Bible doesn't really go into explaining it too well. It tells you this is a fiery place. You know, and heaven is closeness to God. Basically, seeing he- heaven and hell as a closeness or a separation from God. Right. <clears throat> That's really what hell is. When I mean, you're not with God or you're close with God. C.S. Lewis explains this in a way that I always direct people when they're saying, the what is heaven? Is what Incredible. is hell? I'm like, read The Great yeah. Divorce if you want right. to understand what this is. And these are the auxiliary works that help us explain the what's in the Bible on a more... And a more, a more, they, a more current form. That's that's more close because that's the way the Lord works, and He wants us to continue to do these things. Same with when I read Dostoevsky or something, I get those same revelations because He want He. That's that that further explanation of truth. Or even like watching The Chosen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say go. that. There's tons of media, art will do that. Um, you don't even have to have the Word of God to look at a sunset to have reverence. And reverence, that is from God. When you have reverence in your heart, you don't know who you're respecting or why that feeling is there. God put that in you. So yeah, it's it's found everywhere. And Paul even says, you don't the word is for those who don't see what that far. He's like, if you just look at nature, you're gonna see God. That's what Thomas so, Paine believes. And well, there's a lot of truth to that, but we're not all, I'm not that smart. I'm gonna be honest with you. I need this. And so when and he's given us this, and so this is an important thing to realize. Okay, we talked about this a little bit at our last Iron Disciples. God judges the heart. He judges hearts according to their resources. I have as many Bibles as I could want. I have commentary. I have all of the study tools that you're going to find in the top-notch seminary schools right here. Right here. If you're not utilizing those tools, God's going to judge you for it. Because you're just sitting on your hands when you could be furthering the kingdom. You could be reading. You could be in, You could be investing Allowing the Lord to work through you. So, and that's that's the fun. Because I know I had issues with not understanding it. If it wasn't for the Iron Disciples, I never would have took the plunge to actually study this this way. But God provides. So if you have an issue with hell and you pick up C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce, who do you think put that book in your way? God did. He's making sure that you're getting your... If you really pray for re- revelation on issues that you just can't connect the dots on, and you're still seeking... He's going to open the door for you. Jordan Peterson brought up, he was talking to Joe Rogan, I believe. I forget which podcast in particular, but he went on to very bluntly say that it's all founded upon the Bible. And he kind of just shot it. I out like loved that. That, and that was that. so I, powerful, I, man. When I, what he, it all comes down to the original truth, which is right here. All the great works, all these auxiliary works, all of it, it's founded upon this network first. Amen. Amen. And that's where you see God in, in the nature. Why are all these great literary works, Dostoevsky, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Thomas Paine? He may have not been, you know, a, a devout Christian, but you know what? 
ninety percent of what he was talking about was influenced by. He needed that was to a do big a motivator. very big work because back then science I think it's and the great. church were conflicting very hard. Oh, I know all about it. science. Church science. was afraid of science. Yep, science was just going to eventually back up the word of God. That's where faith wasn't happening for the church. Yeah. They were afraid of that creation would somehow undercut the Bible. That's not going to happen. All it's going to do is show you that well, God. The was... irony, and this is a tangent, but the irony of it all is that science in its beginning. And the, the atheists, the new atheists, they want you to believe that science and religion were always at odds. That is not the truth. That is not the truth. Nothing could be further from that. No, but we talk truth. about Galileo being excommunicated. I don't want to di- di- um, um, digress too much yeah. into that. But what I want to say is that when you have faith in God and you're exploring his creation, like I used to say this, I said this in a bunch of podcasts before, whatever dark rabbit hole you're going down, God's going to be there. Yes. If you God have a made heart the for black God. holes, God may, oh, even if you don't have a heart for God and you're sitting there down there far away from God, you're going to see that He'll God is you. present. You're find He'll his come find you. Because he made it. What I mean to say, what I mean to say is this. If you're a believer and you enter into a place in your reading, and there's you. You need revelation. You need to know what's actually going on here. God will. The, it feels like it's chaos. It feels like it's disconnect. One of the most uncomfortable feelings a man or woman can have is doubt. Okay, but let your doubt be the vehicle of your faith, because without doubt, without question, without things always adding up perfectly, there no is growth. no faith. Well, there is no faith. You have no faith at that point. You've just rationalized your way all the way to heaven. You haven't been digging into things if you haven't have any doubt. Right. So, like, when you're, say, for instance, you're, you're uh, a man who does not have faith. And I know what Joe's describing because Jesus, God made everything. He made every single thing. Every single thing that you see, think about, that ever was, that ever will be, he made with a purpose. So you're never alone. Neither of those people that think they're alone, like you were saying, he'll reach you. He'll find you. But again, the auxiliary works. I just want to push this home. If you're wrapped up in in all this stuff, a teacher, and you're not reading your Bible, you need to stop. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to fast. Go back to the basics. Know what those basics are so you can judge what a good auxiliary work is from a bad one. And be able to really take this in and read it. Read it over and over again. If you don't understand something and you plug it into your phone and you start reading commentaries, you start reading the Greek lexicon, you start saying, oh, well, mercy can mean this, this, and this. What did that actually mean? How did that make sense for the Greeks to say it and then we chose to say it this way? A good example of that is like when Jesus is having dinner, or no, rather he gets questioned by the... Oh, it's like when he's questioned by the John's disciples where... He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's one of those. But anyway, he says, I desire, desire mercy, not sacrifice. Oh, they're asking if he sacrificed. They're asking if he fasted, I believe. Okay. But um, anyway, well, he was quoting scripture. He was quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. And when you look at some of the, the translations, mercy, it's a good word. And when you look at its definition... You can kind of understand what he's saying. But when you read Hosea 6, 6, and you look at the lexicon, it says, I desire closeness to God, relationship with God, not sacrifice. And a light bulb goes, you get your mind blown. You're like, that's what Jesus was saying. That's what he was saying. Mercy, yeah, I get mercy. But when you see that little sentence formulate, and what he was saying to the Pharisees, like, you guys are stuck in these sacrifices and learning these things and, and, you know, the penance. He's like, I want you guys to be close to me. What was he doing? He was laying next to sinners, intimately, hanging out with them. So he was living it, saying it, and quoting it. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that's the way you can do it. If there's a port you don't get, study it. Pray for revelation. Fast, man. Show God you care enough. Show him you care enough about the question. Don't be Pilate. What is truth? He's staring truth dead in the eye. And he turns his back because he's a sarcastic, know-it-all guy. So many of us that are like that. It's like, you want me to stump you? What is truth? I've seen it all. Everybody's lying out the wazoo. And so are you probably, Jesus. But he didn't stay around. He just said, checkmate, bye. I would love to know what Jesus told him. That Jesus didn't tell him to turn around. He lived his life. 
and he put in the work and pilot had that opportunity he missed it let's not miss it I'd lean Beautiful. into him good Amen. spot to end boys yeah I agree chapter four done did both today by the power of the Holy Spirit awesome the gifts of coffee <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for uh, being able to dig into your word again. God, as we go through Matthew, Lord, I just keep pray that you keep showing us who you are through your word. Um, show who you are to your audience too, Lord, that they will just learn from us or learn together with us, Lord. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for this uh, this conversation that we can talk to, to you, talk about you and read your word freely. Mm-hmm. Pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we always forget to do this, but subscribe, y'all. Yeah, subscribe. <laughs> subscribe and like. Good subscribe move. and like and comment the algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.